Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste friends, welcome back to this lecture number 6 uh, in the series on course on psychology of language. Uh, what we have been doing in this course is uh, we are looking at uh, the psychological aspect of uh, language, what it means, how it is developed, how it is perceived and how a language is used as a medium of communication. Before we start this lecture which is the 6th lecture and progress on uh, the concept of speech perception. Let us take a look back at what we did up till now on what we have been doing in this course up till now. So, we started off uh, this course by looking at the basic of language, the meaning of language, why it is needed and uh, the best model to do that is to look at animal communication system. So, we started off by looking at animal communication systems. Uh, we looked at the modes of an animal communication and we looked at the reasons of why uh, animals communicate and therefore, uh, thereon uh, we looked at four different needs uh, why animals communicate right from finding foes uh, to uh, finding friends uh, or, or for just finding food or replication that th these are the needs. So, we discussed that uh, as reasons why animals communicate. And uh, then we looked at certain characteristics of the animal communication system. We moved ahead by looking at uh, the human language uh, and, and the basics of human language and what is the difference of uh, human language system and the animal language system. So, there we uh, focused on uh, the fact that human language uh, can very well transmit a number of uh, messages, various types of messages and express different messages, uh, but that is not possible with uh, the uh, animal language system and that is one of the distinctions, uh, but there are several other distinctions of the uh, human language system from the animal language system. For example, being that uh, human language systems are governed by rules and they uh, are uh, uh, they have structured components. So, they have uh, a syntax a way of expressing the language system. Also, they are productive in nature and human language systems use arbitrary symbols of various facts of the human language system. Then we looked at uh, things like uh, duality of patterning, recursive uh, uh, structure and so several other uh, characteristics of the human language system. We looked at how the human language system is arranged in, in terms of uh, the phonemes, basic speech sounds to the morpheme, uh, the word, sentence discourse and so on and so forth. So, how it is basically uh, built up uh, the, uh, the phrase, the sentence and so on and so forth. So, that is another thing that we looked at. Uh, further to it we looked at the evolution of language of uh, how human language system actually evolved from animals and we looked at the continuity and discontinuity theories of uh, language production or how language uh, develop and both of them have their own uh, ideas of uh, how human language evolved. And then we looked at uh, certain proofs of uh, uh, the proto language because human language system was believed to be um, an upcoming of uh, slow development from uh, the, um, the prior humans or, or the monkeys I would call them. Uh, so, uh, we looked at evidences that support this view that it was a uh, success, it a series of changes that led to the present complex language that we know of. So, we, we verified the idea of proto language and we looked at evidences uh, for example, uh, the evidence of a pidgin which is basically a language system which has uh, certain action words and uh, <coughs> handful of other words which can express meaning between 
two language systems uh, where both the parties expressing the uh, language or talking to each other expressing views with each other cannot understand their uh, either's language. So, Pitgin is, is basically an evidence for uh, the fact that language developed in a progressive manner. So, uh, that was what we did uh, initially and uh, since we had laid the foundation of uh, the language system and what is uh, language and the principles of language and the basics of language, we moved on to looking at the signs of language. So, uh, there we described the famous N400 uh, experiment and uh, then we described the scientific method in detail right expressing uh, what is a problem statement, how a hypothesis is formulated and how this hypothesis uh, leads to uh, the generation of uh, 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 or, or the hypothesis, how this hypothesis is generated uh, rather from a theory and how that, that is tested. So, we looked at the research cycle which is how theory leads to uh, hypothesis which further leads to observations and these observations lead to certain patterns and these patterns verify the theory, maybe verify or not verify the theory. So, we looked at the research cycle of how research is basically done. We looked at uh, experimental designs which are used for conducting um, experiments in language and uh, in specific and social sciences in general. And so, we looked at uh, uh, within subject design and uh, the idea of between subject design. We also looked at uh, various component of the experimental process like uh, what are different kind of variables, the independent variable, the dependent variable and how they are manipulated and how they construct the whole idea of doing research. So, uh, having described uh, the independent variable, uh, another idea or another step was describing the dependent variable which was what do we measure out of uh, these experiments uh, that we do in language. And so, we looked at the idea of latency which is the reaction time of how quickly something is set upon or uh, uh, how quickly something is uh, a particular act is done and we also looked at accuracy of how correct a particular act is. So, uh, these two measures are the main measures uh, that is generally used in experimental um, exp experimental uh, treatments of our experimental problems in language. Uh, uh, further, we uh, dedicated a section on language and brain and we looked at how various regions of the brain are uh, processing language for example, the, uh, the idea of Wernicke area, the idea of Broca's area and how these areas have their say in uh, language. So, that is what we did in the uh, second uh, section which is chapter number uh, lecture number 3 and 4. Now, the previous lecture that we did was on looking at perception of sound. So, how does uh, sound uh, the uh, how are sound uh, produced and what is speaking basically. So, how sound is uh, uh, the, the, the idea of sound is perceived. So, we looked at certain parameters of sound as a wave. So, we looked at the amplitude and frequency which is the basic measure or the basic uh, uh, parameters of any sound wave. Uh, then uh, we looked at uh, the idea of the fundamental frequency and the idea of overtones of what they are. Uh, further to that, uh, we looked at how uh, these uh, sounds uh, are a periodic and periodic in nature and how these periodic and per periodic sounds are the sounds of vowels and consonants. Uh, then further to it, we looked at the structure of uh, uh, the ear of how the ear perceives sound. So, we looked at how uh, the outer ear, the inner ear and the middle ear they combine with each other and we looked in detail the idea of the cochlea and the basilar membrane which uh, uh, perceives or which um, uh, notices changes in the sound wave as they flow on the liquid on the basilar membrane. We looked at the tonotopic organization of the basilar membrane and how this basilar membrane uh, which have hair cells which pick up the sound waves, how they are connected to uh, the uh, primary auditory cortex and the secondary auditory cortex and how the organization of the primary and secondary or, or, uh, uh, auditory cortex are similar in way to the basilar membrane which is tonotropic in uh, organization 
organization we then looked at how the speech stream looks like so when we speak something what is it exactly uh, we, we tried to look at that and with the help of uh, uh, spectrograph or the uh, with the help of uh, what a spectrograph notices uh, we tried to look at uh, what is the speech stream like or what is speech like. So, what is a spectrograph? Uh, spectrograph uh, visualizes the structure of the speech stream. So, we looked at that and thereupon we uh, tried to look at what are consonants and what are vowels and how these consonants and vowels are uh, distinguished based on the uh, spectrograph. We also looked at what the idea of phonation uh, which is the uh, vibration of the vocal fold and we also looked at the idea of what is prosody which is the uh, changes subtle changes in the uh, vocal code around the fundamental frequency. Now, um, we uh, also looked at uh, certain other uh, characteristics of the speech stream for example, the idea of uh, formants uh, or sorens and how these formants and sorens are formants basically are for vowels and sorens are uh, kind of vowel and then we looked at plosives and um, uh, fricatives which are uh, the representation of consonants onto the speech stream. So, that is what we were doing in uh, the last class. Then uh, further to that we looked at how sound is perceived or uh, in categorical format. So, basically the if you look at a, a speech stream on a spectrograph you will uh, look at a continuous uh, you will look at you, you would not look at a continuous uh, pattern you will look at patterns uh, which have uh, higher amplitudes and no amplitudes in between and then again higher amplitude. So, we looked at how uh, this uh, this is interpreted because speech is continuous in nature. So, how does uh, the, the spectrogram uh, represent it and so the space white spaces which you see in a spectrogram are actually consonants and these are called the stop consonants. So, uh, that is what it is and so speech actually merges itself. So, uh, then we looked at how the speech is perceived and we saw that speech sound or speech is perceived in terms of categorical perception or in terms of categories. So, uh, uh, sound speech sounds are forced into various categories and that is how they are perceived and that was what we were looking at. So, uh, to demonstrate that speech are uh, speech is perceived in cate uh, or categorical perception happens in uh, speech a uh, famous phoneme restoration effect was demonstrated that is where we ended the section and we saw how Warren and Warren uh, did an experiment and, and showed how uh, this phoneme restoration effect is uh, basically demonstrated. To end the section uh, in the last class we describe something called McGroic effect which basically says that speech perception is uh, not only uh, through the auditory medium, but other mediums also like visual medium is also used and we demonstrated the idea of how somebody speaking and somebody um, uh, lip uh, uh, speaking a particular uh, word how when they are shown to each uh, shown to the same person how the person misreads. So, basically multimodal approach to perception saying that auditory feedback is not the or auditory uh, uh, stimu stimulation is not the only way of speech perception a multimodal technique is used by the human brain to perceive speech. Now, what we are going to do in today's class will is look at how uh, speech is developed uh, in the neonates in small children how speech is developed and towards the end of the section we will look at several theories of speech perception. So, that is what uh, the aim is uh, is uh, presently in this lecture. So, development of speech perception and language learning in the womb. So, how does it uh, uh, is it starts uh, in, in the smaller children. So, uh, language learning it generally begins in the womb during the third trimester. So, by the third trimester the, the, the neonate or the baby inside the fetus uh, in inside the mother's womb is able to hear speech sounds or is able to perceive speech sound which extends from week number 28 until birth uh, that is weeks number 38 or later. So, from the third trimester onwards the baby is able to actually hear speech sounds of the mother or other people around uh, the womb. So, during the as, as you can see that is the same thing that I have here. So, during the third trimester fortices can hear mother's voice and environmental sounds and so it tries and it is also able to uh, distinguish this mother's uh, voice and environmental sound. Now, a fetus at the third trimester uh, can hear and respond to sounds in the environment 
particularly the mother's wife. So, that, that is what it can do and so there were a, a, a number of experiments which are there which were done to prove that the baby is able to hear the uh, mother's uh, sound and other environmental noises and uh, uh, these can be done with uh, either the, uh, the head movement reflex or uh, the uh, nipple sucking reflex. So, there are several uh, uh, experimental techniques which are used for uh, showing that this kind of response or the fetus is actually able to hear the sounds. Now, uh, one way to demonstrate that uh, the fetus is able to hear the sound is uh, the uh, change in uh, fetal heart uh, rate. So, uh, the fetuses can discriminate stimuli. So, when the fetus hears actually a uh, um, a stimuli, a vocal stimuli or speech stimuli which is different from or noble stimuli which is different from what he has been hearing, the uh, heart rate increases, but when he hears a stimuli which is similar to what he has been hearing, he decreases the heart rate and so uh, that uh, particular response is, uh, is, is what is um, a demonstration of the fact that the fetuses can actually hear the sounds. Now, at birth the newborn can already distinguish. Um, uh, its mother's voice from other women's voice and its mother's language from other language. Now, at week number 35 and 37, fetuses can recognize mother's voice, mother's language spoken by another woman and uh, primary nursery rhyme. So, even if uh, the, so, there were experiments done in which the mother's fundamental frequency or the fundamental pitch was removed, it was filtered out and only uh, the uh, basic uh, prosody was there or the basic uh, uh, prosody of uh, uh, the mother's tone was there in the voice. So, higher frequencies were split out. Even then the child was able to respond to or child was able to um, hear the mother's voice or distinguish the mother's rise, uh, voice in terms of the heart rate. Also, uh, if uh, another woman uh, which is not the mother, if she speaks in 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 uh, in a manner similar to the mother, the child actually uh, showed a change in its uh, its uh, uh, basic heart rate, which basically means that he was able to uh, uh, able to realize the or uh, able to respond to the mother's language. Now, uh, in one experiment, uh, Dr. Sue's fairy tale was told uh, was uh, recited to these uh, uh, 35, 37 years fetuses, and so they were able to um, uh, respond to these these even if a different uh, woman other than the mother was uh, playing this particular or uh, uh, was reciting this particular nursery rhymes. So, in when direct another uh, interesting thing uh, which used to measure uh, the fact that uh, babies can hear speech sounds uh, was uh, the high amplitude sucking technique. So, in this technique what was happened is a non nutritive uh, 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 nipple was given to the baby and uh, he would suck on uh, the, the way he sucks on to the nipple on hearing uh, different sounds familiar and non-familiar sounds demonstrated how uh, or whether the baby can uh, distinguish between the mother's voice or familiar voice versus un, uh, non-familiar voices. So, measures frequency of infant sucking on non-nutritive nipple and changes in the frequency indicate discrimination of stimulus and this was used on newborn. So, in, this is another interesting thing which was there and so this was used to demonstrate the fact that babies smaller children were able to uh, hear. Uh, this this sound or uh, the distinction between familiar and non-familiar uh, sounds. Now, newborns are known to prefer mother's voice and so this, this was demonstrated by uh, the high amplitude sucking uh, technique. Also, mother's language which is spoken by another woman was also preferred by most newborns. So, as, as related to uh, the, the fetal or the fetus which actually uh, demonstrated a change in heart rate similar to them newborns also demonstrated uh, this high amplitude uh, through the high amplitude sucking technique they also demonstrated that they preferred mother's language if spoken by another uh, woman uh, more than 
um, uh, and any other uh, any other text which other woman was speaking. Also, family nursery rhymes which they hear in the womb when it was played back after they were born, they preferred to that, and that was demonstrated through this high amplitude sucking technique. Now, clearly, newborns uh, remember what they heard in the womb, and so this this basically demonstrate that the uh, baby, the fetus, were actually able to uh, hear. Uh, these um, sounds or uh, these um, uh, the changes in uh, sounds are able to um, uh, discriminate between these sounds. Now, how do the mother pass on uh, this language ability into the child and so that that, that happens to something called uh, baby talk. So, uh, what we have demonstrated what we have established up, up till now is the fact that the babies are, are uh, fetuses or newborns uh, they can distinguish or they can hear voice or the mother and they can make distinctions between the mother's voice and, uh, or, and other familiar voices with uh, different voices and that we have shown that not only at the uh, level of the fetus, but also when they are born they saw this distinguishing. So, at the fetus level uh, the change in heart rate is a measurement of uh, uh, the likingness to a certain uh, certain sound and or the distinguishing between a certain familiar and non familiar voices. When they are born the, the, the newborns uh, as old as uh, one, uh, uh, one month old uh, uh, by using the, uh, the sucking technique the high amplitude sucking technique they also can demonstrate that they can differentiate between the uh, various changes into the <coughs> or they can discriminate between family <laughs> non family voices now the question is how uh, mothers are able to teach their children to speak so how do they perceive speech or how do speech perception is taught by the mothers to the small children and that happens by something called infant directed speech. So, uh, as you know most infant directed speech are something called motherese, so these are a manner in which the uh, ch child and the mother they speak to each other or most caregivers speak to the children. So, they are basically small utterances with high pitch utterances and so these are what is called motherese. So, infant directed speech is spoken with a higher fundamental frequency, a broader pitch range and exaggerated information and stress pattern and so this kind of fact direct, uh, directed speech is the first demonstration or the uh, first way in which uh, the mother um, interacts with the child. So, the manner of speaking to infants attracts their attention and helps them to learn the language. So, basically language learning starts right when uh, the child is born and this uh, starts with uh, the infant directed speech with either the mothers or the caregivers give to the children. And so, what are they? These are high, uh, these are uh, uh, speech with high fundamental frequency in a broader pitch range. And so, they have exaggerated information with uh, 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 different stress patterns. So, higher fundamental frequency then gr uh, greater range of pitch also exaggerated stress contrast and vowel lens. So, uh, we get to children we generally use uh, the stress on any uh, any word is uh, is exaggerated and the vowel length also when speaking a vowel the way we speak to children uh, small children or, or just born in infants the way we see this the vowel length is also increased. So, that th this is done so that the child is able to perceive the speech or perceive the speech changes, uh, the changes that is happening in the speech and so that that is the first learning or this is the first uh, uh, technique of speaking of uh, making the children learn the speech. So, nearly universal phenomena and so uh, uh, this way of speaking with exaggerated stress con contrast and verbal length by the mother to the children is a universal phenomena. So, all across the world is the same way the mother speak to the children. Now, right after birth itself the uh, child spends a lot of time uh, with the mother and there is a lot of eye contact and there is a lot of speaking uh, from both the spies. Although the, the uh, the child may not be able to speak, but he expresses himself in terms of woos and calls and that is responded by speech by the mother and that is the first way or the first technique or the, or the first step in uh, language learning by the child. So, the child is able to perceive those changes, perceive um, changes in the in the phonation or uh, perceive uh, the prosodic changes in the mother's voice and that is how he starts learning how to speak or what speech is 
<coughs> made up of or how language is one interesting fact when a child is born he can distinguish at the time of being uh, birth he can distinguish uh, probably all between uh, all uh, languages so give him any language and he will be able to discriminate between two uh, uh, patterns of speech but as he grows by the first month itself he uh, loses this capacity of uh, understanding or uh, pointing out changes in patterns of speech and so that's we'll discuss later in in the speech perception theory or the uh, the theory of speech perception so basically what we're trying to i'm trying to tell you here is that the manner of speaking uh, speaking of the mother it has a lot of role uh, in in developing the language system and so what it is how, how does it start it starts by the mother uh, uh, basically producing high fundamental frequency uh, sounds and these high fundamental frequency sounds are what is uh, perceived by the children so uh, basically uh, this is called the mother ease or caregiver speech so this pattern of uh, speaking of uh, using uh, elaborated syllables and, and uh, longer vowels and <coughs> speaking is mother is or caregiver's speech. Now, uh, these um, uh, mother is and caregiver's speech is the fundamental uh, step in uh, teaching the child, the newborn, the uh, basics of any language. And so, there is, there is a, a theory which is called the prosodic uh, bootstrapping theory which says that this particular mother is or caregiver speech uh, the way it is uh, delivered to the children or the way it is used in the children it actually helps the children in identifying uh, speech or in identifying how a particular language is spoken so the per, uh, the the prosodic bootstrapping hypothesis <coughs> it proposes that infants use in intonations and stress patterns to infer phase and word boundaries. So, how does the infant know when a word has ended or what is a word and what is a phrase and the way he does is by using something called prosodic bootstrapping. So, he, he looks at intonations uh, which is how the mother's voice is changing and the stress that the mother is uh, is, is uh, uh, putting in in the mother is and based on the <coughs> these intonations and stresses the child is able to demarcate the word boundaries and phase boundaries in the speech and so that is the first step in learning to speak the particular language now there are there are a number of uh, the, uh, an, an, a number of evidences uh, which uh, basically uh, support the notion of persodic bootstrapping. So, whether persodic bootstrapping happens or not, uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, prosodic bootstrapping, whether it happens or not, uh, there is a lot of evidences or there are at least some evidences out there which, uh, which suggest that this prosodic bootstrapping actually happens. Now, for example, um, infants are sensitive to in indicators of phase boundaries and mother ease. And so, this, this the one of the evidences uh, is that the infants are actually sensitive or so sensitiveness to indicators of phase boundaries and in the mother ease. So, this, this basically sensitivity to phase boundaries uh, uh, suggests that infants are able to uh, bootstrap uh, the the uh, the, uh, the prosodic um, uh, uh, speech and or prosodies in the speech and so are able to distinguish between word boundaries. Also, there was a ERP study uh, which was done on five months old German infants and uh, what was found out that they, has, uh, they were sens uh, sensitive to acoustic cues and phase boundaries, speech changes and, and vowel duration and according to this speech changes and vowel duration, the German uh, ch children five months old they were able to understand the spoken speech or they were able to at least use cues from the acoustic uh, motheries uh, that, that, that was used. And so, that made them understand what is the boundary of a word or where a word is there and where a phrase has ended and how this actual speech is composed of what what in, in what pattern uh, it is arranged and where should the breaks be. So, basically at, uh, at the point of time when they do not know what a word is or what a phrase is, uh, the, the certain cues from the, uh, the, the, the way the mother speaks to the child, uh, these cues are utilized by the child to understand word boundaries and so this is this is a basically a very interesting fact that 
children as small as 5 months old are able to distinguish these kind of patterns or this kind of syntax or rules into the spoken uh, stream. Another interesting thing is about the English language. So, now the English language has a uh, metrical segment strategy which basically means that most English languages have stress on the first syllable and not on the second syllable unlike some other languages out there like French which has the stress generally it has stress on the uh, second syllable. And so, metrical segment strategy is another strategy which is used both by the infants and adults uh, not by the adult but the infants to understand the speech stream or to understand the boundaries. So, according to the metrical segmentation uh, strategy both infants and adults they tend to segment the speech stream at the onset of stress syllables and at least in the English language. So, they know that the most words in the English language starts by a stress on the first syllable and so that is how they are able to segment. So, metrical uh, segmentation strategy says that these are rules of thumb for segmenting speech stream. So, if there is a speech stream if somebody something is being stressed uh, is being spoken how this is broken down into its basic properties or into basic uh, segments is done by something called the, uh, the metrical segmentation strategy. They assume that words begins on stress syllables for example, in English because French uh, words they they uh, could actually have <laughs> the French words they can actually have a stress on the second syllables also also used by infants and adults to segment this speech stream. Now it is believed that English has a characteristic rhythmic pattern of uh, alternating stress and unstressed syllables. Now, uh, the stressed syllables have long or complex vowels uh, sounds while the unstressed syllables in English have reduced or shortened vowels. So, basically this idea that English has a rhythmic pattern of stress and unstressed variables uh, uh, syllables and uh, the idea that the stressed syllables are long or complex words of uh, complex vowel sounds while un un unstressed syllables have reduced shortened vowels this is another. Uh, interesting thing or uh, used by uh, the the children or the uh, the neon is the small uh, uh, children or newborns to understand the speech segmentation how to divide the uh, the speech which is there now understand that the child when he is born he doesn't have the idea of uh, uh, the phonemes morphemes and that kind of a thing so basically what he does is he picks up these strings or picks up these ideas or generates these ideas uh, from uh, the way the mother is talking to um, the, the children and so this kind of idea are uh, this kind of probability the probability is that, that these are the uh, rules which are used by uh, the smaller children or uh, uh, children who are uh, 6 to 8 months old uh, or uh, maybe around 6 months old. Uh, so, smaller children uh, to use understand the speech stream. So, Morgan 1996 he uh, did an experiment to find out whether this uh, metrical segmentation strategy is true or not and so he presented two syllable sequences uh, with stress on either the first and the second syllable. So, uh, the idea was that whether smaller children or uh, uh, um, so uh, smaller children or older children they can distinguish between whether children can actually distinguish between this metrical segmentation strategy or can understand uh, the difference between uh, first stress syllable and the second stress syllable. So, what Morgan did was he produced words or he presented two syllable sequences uh, with stress either on the first word uh, on, uh, on the first syllable or the second syllable to 6 and 9 months old uh, 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 infants and they found out uh, the 6 months infant they did not respond to uh, the differences between uh, the first stress syllable and second stress syllable whereas, the 9 months old were able to distinguish between the uh, first stress syllable and second stress syllable. So, when the second stress syllable was produced they did not uh, give this head response or they did not respond to it or they were not able to distinguish between it and that was the, uh, the demonstration of metrical segmentation strategy as used by infants and adults to uh, segment the speech uh, system. Condition heart head turning technique. Now, infants train to turn head when he detected changes in st uh, stimulus. So, another technique that is used to uh, uh, since children are small, so uh, how would they uh, uh, show responses when they are able to distinguish this change in speech stream? And so, one another technique which is there is condition head turning technique. So, till the point of time that they cannot do this head turn thing, the 
uh, the high amplitude sucking technique is used, but then if they can turn their head a conditioned head turning technique is used to demonstrate that the child is able to uh, distinguish between certain aspects of the speech streams. So, uh, as I said no, in Morgan's, uh, Morgan's experiment 9 months infant prefers strong weak stress pattern over weak strong stress pattern. So, uh, when it was first syllable stressed and second syllable non stress uh, they preferred this in, uh, in, in relation to when they had the first syllable non stressed and the second syllable stressed. Also, at 6 months the preferences were not there. So, toddlers frequently impose strong weak stress pattern for spaghetti, uh, this case carry manda. So, that kind of uh, variation is there. Another interesting thing uh, that is used by infants to uh, understand the speech pattern or to decipher the speech pattern of their mothers or uh, other caregivers is something called uh, the idea of transaction probability. So, what is transaction probability? Transaction probability is the probability that given a particular sequence uh, uh, what is the probability that the next sequence will follow it or given a particular stimuli what is the probability that uh, related uh, uh, stimuli will follow. So, likelihood of a particular event will occur given uh, next given the current event. So, transaction probability they provide a fairly reliable cue to word boundaries that even young infants are sensitive to. So, uh, basically what definition is the definition says that the likelihood that a particular event will occur uh, given the fact that event will occur next given the current event is all uh, is already occurred is what is called transaction probability. And so, transaction probability what it provides is that is a, is a fairly reliable cue to word boundaries that even young infants are sensitive to. So, basically this transaction probabilities or the probability uh, of the fact that a certain uh, syllable will repeat after some, some other syllable or a certain pattern will repeat after some other pattern is used uh, by infants or is, is, uh, is again used by infants to uh, segment the speech stream. Now, at 8 months infant can use the transaction probability to segment speech stream as tested with condition head turn. Uh, uh, response. So, uh, 8 months old infants were able to use this transaction probability mechanism to, uh, to, to demonstrate to segment the speech stream. For example, if now uh, if pretty baby is, uh, is something that the, um, uh, the um, child is able to or uh, child hears a lot of time. So, if pret uh, this threat is is uh, is spoken then uh, there are there is a very high chance that ty or t will be repeated and so the child is if threat is there the child always responds to uh, or waits for or shows this condition head response to show that ty will follow and so pretty is the word but after pretty uh, the fact that baby will be repeated is very less and so the child is uh, doesn't show any response to that because they, they they do hear so many other words related to it so it's not that pretty baby is <coughs> something that they always hear because <coughs> If the syllable pret is, is produced, they always know or they turn their head to show that ty which is pretty will be uh, what will be spoken next. But the fact that pretty uh, will be followed by baby is uh, the transaction probability is very less and so the child does not uh, show this condition head re uh, response or condition uh, head response to it. But the moment because it could be pretty dog, pretty um, uh, eagle, pretty egg and so on and so forth. So, there can any anything could be there. But as soon as bay is spoken the child shows a condition head reflex to show that baby will be followed load and so when the base syllable is there the by, uh, the b syllable will repeat it that is shown by this transaction probability so the fact that if pret is spoken and ty will follow it this is called uh, the the transaction uh, uh, probability the condition transaction probability and if b is spoken then b will follow this is what is transaction probability but the fact that if pre, if pretty is spoken then baby follows it is uh, is an unfamiliar sequence and so in this case the child <coughs> doesn't respond to the head turning response. 
So, and uh, some other techniques like statistical learning techniques are used by the child to segment the speech stream. What we have been doing all, all along is we are trying to tell you or uh, how the child makes these identification of the speech stream or segment the speech stream. So, when he is hearing a speech, how does he know where to stop and where to uh, uh, start or what are the boundaries of the speech. So, where is the, the word and, and where is uh, the phase boundaries and that kind of thing, how does the child uh, understand that, that is what we are trying to uh, that is what I am trying to tell you. So, in infants the transaction probability from prey to T is very high likewise from B <coughs> to B is again very high. However, uh, the transaction probability from T to B is very low. So, uh, from the syllable T the, the fact that B will follow because it is pretty right and baby. So, pret and T y and B and B Y. So, the transition probability between T A and T Y and B is very low whereas, the transition uh, probability between Pret and T and B and B is <coughs> very very high. So, infants are born with the ability to uh, discriminate most speech sound and through a pro process called perceptual narrowing and um, acquiring the phonetic categories of the language that they are learning during the first year of life. So, another uh, thing that the infants use in segmenting the speech stream is something called perceptual narrowing. So, what is this perceptual narrowing? It is a transition from broad to narrow perceptual category. So, what is it? Uh, they are born with the ability to discriminate most uh, speech sounds and through a process called perceptual narr narrowing, they acquire the phonetic categories of the language uh, uh, they are learning during the first year of life. So, they, they use this perceptual narrowing for uh, categorical perception or uh, putting speech sounds into certain categories. At birth, infant perceive all possible speech categories. Now, by one year, they perceive categories in their language. As I said, as I have been telling before, when a child is born, he is able to uh, categorize differences in any language of the world. But as, uh, as, as he grows or as he learns, as he talks to his mother more and more, he does this perce perceptual narrowing or he attains this perceptual narrowing and then he can only distinguish uh, the speech sounds or speech stream or differentiate between speech streams only in his mother tongue. So, it, uh, experiments were done with English speaking children and Hindi speech or Hindi uh, <coughs> Uh, speech stream and children were or very small just born children were able to discriminate between two sequences. But when this uh, this child became one month old, uh, he was not able to discriminate between changes in speech stream in Hindi, uh, but they were able to do that in English. This particular process of how did they do it is basically called perceptual narrowing. They also use something called the distributed learning technique. So, uh, the perceptual narrowing of phonetic categories is aided by a uh, process which is called uh, distributional learning. So, what is this distributional learning? It is a way of tracking of the frequency and localization of various sounds in the speech stream. So, the distributional learning is a tracking uh, is a process of tracking uh, changes in the speech stream and narrowing down onto or localizing various sound in the speech stream. So, distributional uh, uh, learning is tracking frequencies and localization of various speech sound in the speech stream and it aid infants in organizing perceptual categories out of their language. So, basically the this both perceptual narrowing and distributional learning are two techniques which the infant uses to uh, understand the speech stream which is being spoken to him and to distinguish uh, various uh, characteristics of the speech and understand the speech and, and basically perceive the speech <coughs> and do categorical perception of the speech. So, this is uh, what happens uh, or how the child learns into or learns this uh, uh, speech stream or basically uh, the, the speech. And it is aided a lot by mother is of how mothers speak to their children. Now, towards the end of this section, we will look at several theories of speech and how these theories argument each other and uh, 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 complement and discomplement each other. So, basically there are several, several theories of speech which is out there and so <coughs> these theories of speech is what we are going to learn next. So, we consciously believe uh, that speech stream is a sequence of uh, uh, speech sounds grouped into words and 
phrases. So, we believe that when somebody is speaking, it is basically a continuous flow of words and phrases, uh, but in reality, we know that this is only an illusion. So, speech is not continuous at all, this is there, there is no uh, sorry, speech is not, not non continuous at all, it is a continuous thing. The observation that there are no reliable relationship between a uh, phoneme and the acoustic signal is known as the uh, lack of invariance. So, the way the phoneme is, is being produced and the acoustic signal which is generated out of that phoneme, there is no uh, uh, relation between the uh, two and this is basically what is called the, uh, the lack of invariance. So, no reliable relationship between phonemes and the acoustic signal. So, what signal, what speech signal is generated and what phoneme is being used there is no relation between these two and this is called the lack of invariance. Now, the problem that theories of perception need to explain is how we are able to extract the original speech sound uh, from the speech stream. Now, if the acoustic signal which is being produced and the phoneme which is there, if there is no relation between them, the theories of perception need to express how we perceive speech stream or how we are able to extract these things from the speech stream. And so, the first um, so, problem for all theories of speech perception is that how do we extract original speech sound from the speech stream or the speech uh, signal. So, there are three theories which have been proposed the motor theory, the general auditory framework and the direct realism and so we will go into these one by one. Let us look at the motor theory. So, <coughs> motor theory is a net, it uses a nativistic approach and views that behavior is mainly shaped by natural selection and encoded in genes. So, it believes that speech starts with genes and so it has a nativistic view, it is in the gene somewhere and so from there uh, the speech perception is uh, genetic in nature. Uh, and so, it is basically um, it is supported by Chomsky's ideas of language equation device and Chomsky he believes that there are specialized processing units in the brain, uh, they guide rapid development of the languages infant. So, he believes that that it is the every child comes with a or every person comes with a language equation device and the childhood itself there are specialized units out there which basically uh, uh, let the infant learn the speech. So, Alvin, uh, Alvin Lieberman and his colleagues at the Haskin laboratory built a pattern playback machine that uh, uh, the use of which led to the development of the motor theory of speech perception. Uh, so, uh, it was also the idea of module by Fodder in 1983, which led to the increment in the motor theory. So, dedicated neural systems evolved to perform specific function. So, <coughs> generally speaking, it was Al, uh, Alvin Lieberman's uh, and his colleagues idea of uh, using the, uh, the playback machine to develop this motor theory. And what is the basic idea of this motor theory? The idea of motor, motor theory is that the way we speak is, is it is tracked by the changes in the vocal cord. So, motor theory what it proposes is it proposes that people perceive speech. How do we perceive speech? We perceive speech by inferring the movements of the vocal tract uh, that produce this sound. So, by looking at the vocal tract which is producing this sound, we perceive speech. So, instead of analyzing the speech stream into its phonemes, uh, so be, uh, instead of uh, looking at speech in terms of its phonemes, uh, the perception of speech actually progresses through or it, it manifests through it. It, it, it happens through tracking the way the vocal tract is responding when somebody is producing speech. In other words, we comprehend speech by imagining how we would make the sounds we are hearing. So, speech perception happens by, uh, by another person or somebody who is hearing somebody speak, uh, how he perceives speech is by uh, imagining how he would have produced that speech and so by uh, that manner the speech perception happens. So, influenced by the theories of Chomsky and Fodder, motor theory argued that speech is special in um, in, in, in manner. So, that is the basic of uh, the, the motor theory, but as, as I said before Chomsky's idea was there is something called the language equation device and so this language equation device is the uh, way or the reason how uh, the smaller children or infants develop speech. Also, Fodder 1983 proposed the idea of a module and he says that the brain has dedicated neural systems for learning speech and that is how speech is, uh, is, is basically perceived. And so, based on both their ideas, it was believed that speech is special in, uh, it is a special uh, uh, quality of human beings and views of speech perception as distinct from general auditory perception. They believe that speech is different from general auditory perception. So, viewing of other auditory sounds is different from a new 
hear somebody <laughs> speak. Now, what it says is that speech is processed by innate dedicated modules that are sep uh, separated from general auditory perception. Now, speech is special was based on several reasons. Now, motor theory they uh, people perceive speech by inferring articulated gestures of not analyzing the speech stream. So, <coughs> basically the idea that speech is special it is uh, dedicated or it, it rest on three uh, basic reasons. First, speech perception uh, and production was viewed as a unique human ability. So, three reasons speech production and perception is unique to humans first. Second, speech perception uh, modules work independent of auditory perception. So, speech modules they are independent of auditory perception system and the third third reason is that speech perception was proposed by the motor system. It was believed that speech perception motor system aids speech perception or speech perception happens through the motor system. So, so three, these three reasons were quoted for the, for the fact that speech is <laughs> special. Also D another reason that was given is that the objects of speech perception was not speech sound themselves, but rather the intended vocal tract gestures. So, uh, speech perception was not looking at speech sounds, but on vocal tract gestures. So, how does the vocal tract actually move that was the reason of or that was the way the speech perception should be uh, done and so this is the this is the framework on which uh, the or motor theory was based now ample research has been shown that non human animals uh, they perceive speech sounds in much the same way as humans do forcing motor theorists to forsake the position that speech is special and so this idea that speech is special is basically uh, nullified or it is been taken back uh, by the uh, uh, by these evidences that non humans and uh, non humans way, um, uh, would perceive speech sound in much the same way as humans do. So, that is the basic of the um, motor theory. Now, uh, to distinguish the motor theory or to uh, to basically cover up the fact of motor theory that speech is special another theory was proposed which is called the general auditory framework. The general auditory framework what does it say speech perception operates at the same mechanism that have evolved for the perception of environmental sound. So, uh, there are several what is the proposal the proposal is that speech perception operates by the same mechanisms that have evolved for perceiving environmental sounds and they are not special speech perception is not special from uh, some other ways of uh, perception. Now, there are several evidences uh, which go against the motor theory which has been provided by the general auditory framework which goes against the motor theory. The first evidence against motor theory is that human infant speech uh, processing. How humans infant process speech that has been quoted as the uh, basic reason of how the uh, general auditory framework differs from the motor theory. Now, human infants are born with the ability to discriminate nearly all possible speech sounds yet they do not begin speaking a year later. So, as has been said that they are able to discriminate all speech sounds, but they do not speak by first year and so they basically that is a uh, that is the reason that these general auditory framework people uh, they propose against the motor theory. But then general auditory framework believes that infants have this ability because human languages only make sound distinctions that, uh, that the auditory system is already sensitive to. So, the way the human auditory system perceives is the same way is used uh, for perception of speech and so infants also use the same system. Now, the motor theory is also cite human infant speech processing as support for their own theory especially the claim that speech perception involves innate modules. Motor theory uh, they believe that speech perception production system is hardwired to the brain and guide the development of language specific skills. Uh, in both perception and production during the first year of life. So, uh, the same idea or the same uh, evidence that is used by the general auditory framework people that infant speech processing uh, that that they believe that infant spe uh, speech processing supports their theory the same thing is used by the motor theorist and what the motor theory says that there are innate modules in the uh, speech perception uh, in, the, in the infants which help them in perceiving speech. Whereas, uh, what uh, the, uh, evidence that the uh, general framework people are using is that 
although infants are able to perceive changes in speech or perceive various uh, differences in speech uh, by uh, before one year of age only by one year they start speaking so before one year they can uh, they can do they can understand these changes and they they respond to it also when they see a change but by using perceptual narrowing uh, they start uh, speaking by first year of life and so that's that's one evidence so human inf infants can discriminate speech sounds before they can speak now the second evidence which is uh, which is used by the general auditory framework against the motor theory comes from the observation of speech perception in non human animals for example the uh, chinchillas and so non human animals uh, uh, they can distinguish speech sounds so that's another second evidence so this is my first evidence and this is my second evidence of general auditory framework against the uh, motor theory so chinchillas categorize perceive speech da and ta so they can do this categorical perception also japanese quella perceive d in da d do as the same despite co articulation effects uh, so uh, uh, this this is another uh, thing which is there now speech perception is so complex that we use any available cues now researchers working in the general auditory framework takes the proposition that speech is such a complicated task uh, that human uh, takes advantage of whatever information is available how imperfect to tackle this problem so pre perception is not innate, innate it's <coughs> it's not processed by a dedicated system what it says is speech perception the general auditory framework says that it happens speech perception happens in the same way as the auditory perception but then uh, humans take advantage of all available imperfect cues from the environment and the speech sound itself to distinguish or tackle the problem of speech perception now one example of this approach is something called the fun, uh, the fuzzy logical modules of perception and so what is this model of perception it proposes that we arrive at perceptual decisions uh, by matching the relative goodness of various sensory inputs against their uh, values of percept uh, particular prototype stored in memory so when we are doing perception what we do is we look at various uh, examples of uh, the uh, the object in question and we compare them to prototypes and then we do a matching how good a match is a particular stimuli with the perceptual uh, with the uh, perceptual prototype which has been uh, stored and that gives an idea of how perception um, uh, takes place so lack of invariance isn't a problem because contextual cues are always taken into account and so this general auditory framework doesn't suffer from this uh, idea of lack of invariance so perceptual decisions made by matching relative goodness of sensory inputs to prototypes in the memory and so <coughs> there is a how good the sensory input is based on that the perception is happening so information from other modalities are also used if available so not only the speech perception system visual and other modalities also help the generally auditory framework so chialas categorize perceptual onset time and so this is an example to show that uh, non humans can also do this kind of speech perception and so you know, speech is not special and the last uh, theory that we are going to do today is called something called direct realism so motor theory has made uh, uh, come back with uh, Carol Fowler's um, uh, idea of direct realism which which is again uh, Carol Fowler is again from the Haskin lab now this new version of modern theory is called the direct realism and it is based on Gibson's 1979 theory that we have direct awareness of the world because the sensory input is sufficiently rich for us to completely recover an object for perception now if you remember gibson's idea gibson believed or gave the idea of direct perception and believes that the lies which are falling onto the eyes that has all the information uh, that that is necessary for us to perceive similarly this direct realism also believes that the sound which is falling onto the ear that has enough information for us to perceive speech so direct realism says that sensory inputs is sufficiently rich allowing us to completely recover uh, the objects of perception and it is basically a Gibsonian view uh, as used in perception 1979 direct perception if you do a direct comparison if you want to compare uh, the, how this Gibsonian view fits into this idea now one way in which uh, the direct realism differs from motor theory is that it uh, rejects the idea that speech is special it believes the speech is not special it is general in case and so the speech which is following on your ears has all the information which is necessary for you to perceive you do not do this categorical perception or perceptual narrowing or those kind of things are not there also direct realism they believe that speech processing it involves uh, perceiving gestures not acoustic signals so speech perception is not uh, processing acoustic signals 
rather it is processing gestures. So, based on gestures uh, the perception of speech is happening not on terms of how acoustic signal is perceived. Uh, the, the direct realism also holds on to the claim that uh, the motor system is involved in perception of speech. So, direct realism believes that motor system. So, because these gestures are done by the motor system or the vocal tract and so they believe that the motor system is involved in processing of uh, speech. Now, uh, the idea that uh, hence we have uh, direct awareness of world no influence is needed. Now, the very fact that evidences are provided to this, uh, the, this direct realism is through the concept of something called motor neurons uh, sorry mirror neurons and what is this mirror neurons so mirror neurons which have been first uh, which have been found in monkeys for the first time they provide biological evidence for the uh, tight linkage between perception and action and so what are these mirror neurons mirror neurons are neurons which are uh, in the brains of the primate that fire uh, when they uh, perform a particular action and they also fire when a particular person sees an act that he has done before or he he wants to do and they fire so whether, whether he is observing an act in being action or whether he is act, uh, acting in both the cases the motor neurons actually um, fire and so this this uh, uh, mirror neuron is a biological evidence to the fact that the, the idea that speech is not uh, is, is uh, uh, the idea that there is nothing special in speech. So, it rejects the speech is special thing and motor in system involved in speech perception first, first time we come to know that motor systems are involved in perception of uh, speech. So, mirror neurons these are neurons in primates that fire when perceiving or performing a task. So, not only perceiving a task it is also performing a task and so we do an act uh, or we perceive an act being done the mirror neuron fires. So, uh, that that is basically an evidence a biological evidence to the fact that uh, speech perception is, uh, is is through direct realism and links perception and motor systems together. Also the direct uh, realistic theorist they view mirror neurons as providing the mechanisms for linking perception and action not just in speech but in perception also. Also, uh, the direct realism uh, aligns itself to the notion of embodied cognition. So, it basically uh, uh, it forwards the idea of embodied cognition which basically says that cognition rooted in bodies interaction with the environment and so what is it? Uh, a point of view arguing that cognition is rooted in the bodies interaction with the world around it. So, basically how uh, the, the cognition is not only in, in the mind or brain it is the way we interact with the environment and so, this idea of embodied cognition is very basic to the idea of the, the, the idea of direct realism. The essential purpose of brain is to provide the organism uh, with information about the environment in order to guide the behavior. So, what the brain actually does it provides information to the to the organism about his environment around us the way the organism interacts with the environment in terms of the information which has been provided with the brain that provides the way we perceive speech and so this is the idea of direct realism. So, basically uh, that should bring us to the end of this section. Now, what we did today is we looked at how uh, speech perception happens in neonates. So, basically small children or just born children how do they perceive speech and so we saw several mechanisms, we saw several ways of responding and the, the basic idea that they develop is that this this small children at a very early age uh, even one one month uh, uh, from the time they are born they are able to distinguish these speech sounds and that happens because the mother speak to them in a very particular manner in uh, with the motheries and so these motheries they, the way the motheries is spoken that gives the child to make a perception of what are the word boundaries and face boundaries and that kind of a thing and so that helps them and so uh, this is this is not theoretical because uh, the sucking reflex the high in and uh, 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 sucking reflex and the cut head turning reflex. These two reflexes basically demonstrate the way uh, demonstrate the fact that the child is able to discriminate or the infant is able to discriminate between different speech sounds. We also looked at the idea of how uh, uh, this uh, the, the idea of um, uh, how the idea of uh, uh, we uh, also are able to see uh, how this idea of uh, narrow perceptual narrowing. So, uh, how this perceptual narrowing and, and, and uh, 
distributed uh, learning they are used by the children for understanding speech or variations in speech. Uh, we also saw how transaction probability signal the fact that speech is perceived by children. Next, we focused on uh, the various uh, 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 theories of uh, um, uh, speech perception. We started with motor theory which believes that speech perception is not only perceiving speech, uh, it, it basically speech perception happens the way uh, the vocal cord is uh, vibrating and so the vocal cord vibration uh, is, is, is primary to perception of speech. We also saw the idea in speech perception in motor theory that speech is special and it is basically furthered by Chomsky's idea of the lang language equation device which believes that the child has innate modules or uh, predetermined modules in the brain which helps in uh, processing. Uh, speech also fodder uh, 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 supports this uh, theory or this idea of speech perception. Then we come to the auditory framework, the general auditory framework believes that speech is not special. So, speech perception happens in the similar way in which other non animal uh, or non uh, other auditory um, uh, sp uh, other auditory sounds are perceived and so he gives a lot of evidences this theory the general auditory framework uses a lot of evidences to prove that speech is not special and it is general in nature and speech perception happens by a, f a funny logical uh, method. Now, there is a third concept of speech perception which is called the direct realism which believes that again the motor uh, uh, systems are involved in speech perception and the speech which is coming to uh, the infant or anyone uh, for that matter it has enough information uh, in, in it. To, uh, to be perceived or to give you the idea of perception and it, rec uh, it rejects the idea that speech is uh, special and it uses the concept or you use the evidences of mirror neurons, the biological uh, um, uh, mirror neurons to support its idea that speech is, uh, is, is not special, but it is general in characteristics, but then the speech stream which is coming to you has all the information which is necessary. Further, it also uses something called embodied cognition, it develops the direct realism, it develops the idea of embodied cognition which means that brain creates or it makes us familiar with the environment and our interaction with the environment is what creates cognition around us. So that's a uh, no, that's 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 a review of how speech is uh, perceived and speech is made and perceived. Now, when we meet next, we look at how speech is produced. So, the production of speech uh, by humans that is what we're going to focus in the upcoming two lectures. But uh, until we do that, it is um, uh, goodbye from here, and thank you. Mm -hmm.